few bodies of work have been situated in the landscape and uh, I always love the way photography hands us back the landscape because the landscape's always changing and it must have been <laughs> hard to get there and uh, it's always um, at risk of you know different light and lots of inclemencies <laughs> like with children you know it multiplies all the mm. chaos but when you get the photograph back the landscape is kind of eternal and um, I, I was just wondering like what why what drew you to the landscape given that you'd done a number of bodies of work in the studio where everything is controlled and um, and you don't have to travel and uh, children models are happy this started with haunted country and I tried to imagine where these scenes took place, where these children became lost in the bush. And I began that body of work with a scenic backdrop. And it was very nice, but it didn't allow me into the space. So I thought the only way to really talk about these narratives was to go onto the land and actually to the sites where these children had been lost. So I tried to imagine what these children felt like in this landscape that was probably for the European settlers in the 19th century uh, quite alien, very different to the Europe that they had arrived from. And, uh, and I think that, that drew me in, just being there in real time. Uh, was very important for realising that body of work. But then later on, nothing is real. So it calls into question the idea that you have gone there so that uh, because something happened there, because even the protagonists in these photographs are, well, you know, they, they have no... Um, uh, they're kind of not even human um, and they're in places that are kind of somehow unfathomable. Do you mean in haunted country or in between worlds? Between worlds, especially between worlds, because the, um, the humans are not even human. No, well in that body of work I really wanted to look at what separates um, humans from animals, but really I use that as a metaphor to talk about otherness. And, and how often children are positioned as other in our culture. And they are other to adult. And I thought it would be quite interesting to collapse the two notions of other into the one body, um, children and animal as one. Yeah. Having done that, then I thought, well, if we were to enter the, the world of these animals or, or encounter them in a story or even a dream, mm. where would you imagine these animals? You wouldn't necessarily imagine them in the studio, no. but actually in the landscape. So I, I tried to imagine where these animals would hang yeah. out. Yeah, these are like their horns. Mm. But it's kind of not nature. <laughs> it's not simple nature, is it? Like these, because these guys, as you say, mm. they're not um they're they're between they're between um identities um yes, and so yeah. and in a way the landscape is between identities well, then yes i mean i i guess when we think of landscape in art especially in photography we think of this grand vista um which you know you see in calendar photography and in commercial photography where landscape is portrayed yeah. but I didn't want that vision of landscape I, I wanted a kind of a dreamier landscape mm -hmm. and that's why my landscapes aren't pin sharp you'll notice that mm. with my depth of field is um, it's quite shallow when it comes to the landscape I mean it's it's focused when it comes to the subject but then the landscape just falls out of focus and it's there but not there is that you the know, scenic backdrop concept a it, bit. It is. I mean I just wanted also to invoke this idea of the stage and how the stage is just the setting and in the background but it should never take over the drama that's occurring on the stage but just sets the scene. That's really interesting because 
each of your pictures kind of has a stage like you're if you're in a galley or if you're on a rocky outcrop or if you're by the beach or um, if you're uh, on a mountaintop um, you've always sought some kind of platform like a mm. like a, a stage that that seems to be necessary for you in a world that's kind of quite well, especially, I guess, Australian landscape, which is really spiky and chaotic. And as you know, uh, when I'm out on the land, I'll always say, I need a clear bit of land. I mean, let's get rid of this and let's get rid of that. And uh, did you bring your... Secateurs. Secateurs, yes, let's yeah. get rid of that tree. No, I don't actually intervene to that degree. But I do look for... Um, a landscape that's not going to interfere, that won't cause problems when I'm actually looking at the subject matter. So the landscape, as I yeah. said, is is there in the background and it is like a, a setting or a platform. Look down a fraction sole, just a fraction. Head down a fraction sole. Oh no, that's too much. I was thinking that in, in the same way that um, the landscape functions as a sort of haunt or uh, abode for uh, these funny creatures, you know, these um, geriatric rabbits or, um, or these, um, you know, uh, pigs that seem to be great farmers, um, very industrious uh, little pigs. Um, that you've always got a sort of couch for them. Um, but then I was wondering about the old guys um, that you've been photographing in the next body of work mm -hmm. that are also in a place. And you feel that somewhere maybe they've got their little stove and, you know, they've got their little bed um, and uh, their half, and they make their tea um, somewhere off camera. Yes, you just feel as if they've walked out of their front door. For example, the lantern keeper uh, that uh, portrays an old man in his pyjamas and dressing gown mm. holding a lantern, and he's in the rocks, but you feel that he lives there like a little hobbit, and he's just come out of his mm. rocks or the lighthouse keepers who are on the beach with their pram and, and looking out to the ocean. You just feel that they've walked out of their house. Mm. So I always try to imagine where these people or characters could live. Yeah. How did you come across this thought that from a child who could turn himself or herself into an animal, you would have a child that could turn himself or herself into um, an old person, mm. which is kind of the opposite again. Well, I, I think children go through such rapid transformation from the time that they're babies until they become adults. So, you know, for the first 18 years of their life, they're undergoing so much change and transformation. And I was wondering what it must feel like for them to transition, say, even from being you know, eight through to being a teenager. And, and the expectations for those uh, children have changed. But I thought the same thing actually happens at the opposite end of mm. ageing, where older people uh, are going from that useful stage of their life, even, you know, like post-retirement, but becoming older and frailer. Yeah, yeah. So our expectations of those people change. So I'm not necessarily comparing the two states, but I thought it would be interesting to look at these liminal states mm. and what could we learn from each state. And I was thinking that, you know, when you're young, you often feel old or you're in such a hurry to grow up. Mm. And when you're at the 
the other end of your life when you're old you must have this yearning for your youth or, mm. or looking back and reflecting you want to feel young again and as you age you just want to feel younger and younger and I thought well we carry a germ of each state within us all the time and I wanted to talk about a common humanity N not collapse the body of young and old into one but but look at what we all carry within mm, us sure that's it the mask is a little bit squashed that's it All right. Olympia, can you move a little bit more? There's a tree, that's, that's it, hold that. Now one leg forward. That's it, hold that. So I think I was about four. I saw mum taking pictures of something or someone, I can't remember who it was. And I walked in there and I said, mum, can you take pictures of me instead? I always knew I was interested in costumes and dressing up and, getting into other characters so um, I sort of I thought it would be fun to do that and she yeah we just started doing casual pictures together then it became body of work hold that Olympia that is beautiful am I on 16? Yeah, yeah. each picture sort of tells a story in itself so um, there weren't any that I preferred um, in particular. I mean, I always, the backgrounds used to excite me a lot and um, I guess my emotion could vary depending on what the picture would be. Um, but mostly it was really interesting and I was interested. Jesus. I can't remember um, the first time, but I was always quite eager seeing as though Olympia was always the one that did the photos and I, I don't know, it was kind of something I looked forward to. Um, it's enjoyable. I enjoy being the other person because well, I'm myself, I'm who I am right now, but uh, you know, I, it's often fun to just have a different kind of experience and you can tell what your uh, what the character you're being is from the location, the posture, the costumes. Oh. Hi. Just hold that like so. Hippie, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Bring your oh yeah, I'll cover that. All right, just hold that. The process of finding a location. Uh, depends on a number of things. Often a friend will say to me, I went to such and such a place and um, I think you'd be interested. And they describe the location and I go and have a look. And yes, it can work. Um, sometimes it doesn't. But you can come across locations very unexpectedly. Most of my locations are in and around Victoria. And I've been introduced to them by friends when I've been visiting them in their holiday homes or just in my own travels. I always make a mental note of where I am and what I've seen. Sometimes I just take snapshots of locations that inspire me and I have this memory bank of locations and, and that's what I fall back on. Going back to the landscape, you know, um, there's one picture where Maybe the um, uh, home, home is not so near. Um, well, there are a couple. Um, one is where um, the philosopher is found on mountaintop mm. uh, or a wanderer is found on mountaintop. And the other is where is a family, I reckon, having got out of a car somewhere, has decided to make a photograph. And these people are not so close to home, I guess. What's the story with... The Holiday Makers? The Holiday Makers. Oh, well, that was actually based on childhood memory. 
that uh, we would often just pile into the car and uh, we would drive to some location. It was maybe just a Sunday drive. We would jump out of the car, have our photograph taken, jump back into the car and drive home. <laughs> it was a Sunday outing. These locations were never very glamorous. So my location in the holiday makers is kind of a little bit shabby. Mm. You can it's see the coastal. seaside, yeah. It's coastal, but a little bit shabby. It's not scenic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe we kind of look a little bit shabby. And we wore our Sunday best, but there's something very sad about that it's picture. It's sad, yes, I agree. It's touching. Because we're trying so hard mm. to look... A happy family. Ha like a happy family. Well, it's very tender. It is tender because the mother's so tender towards her daughter and the father is taking a photograph. Mm. I mean, it is a very tender yes, picture. Yes. And, you know, the mum's holding the baby's hand, the child's hand and looking at her and the father's looking at her. And I guess that image also talks about photography and the parents' desire mm. to photograph their family. And maybe it's a picture about myself too, holding the camera. So your pictures are mysterious and becoming more so. <laughs> and as, as we go on mm. in your work, um, you, 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 it seems that you're often inspired by what young people get up to. Mm. But then a point comes where you see that there's a photograph in it and that's where you don't know what they're up to. And um, I was thinking about the gillies in that regard. I, I think what's been happening in my work over the past few years is that I have been concealing the subject. But in a sense, it's because who they appear um, um, in a sense is a mask. You mm. never really know what is going on behind that facade. No. So for me, I thought there was no point in actually trying to, to show it because it didn't convey any more meaning than it did when it was concealed or hidden or suppressed. And I found that the more that I suppress the identity and abstract the figure, the more the figure becomes universal. So that's weird. So it, I conceal, but through that... Um, process I'm revealing a lot more about the person you actually invite to ask a lot more questions about the person's identity than if if it was um, revealed to you that perhaps you know you have the answer and you mm. wouldn't be as interested in finding out what is actually going oh, on yeah and who this person is so in a body of work that I'm considering at the moment I'm going to conceal the figure completely so um, no part of the body will be visible. I took a momentary interest in archery and so I went into a shop um, and I found this incredible looking suit and I thought wow what is this and I found out later that it was this ghillie suit and it fascinated me. You can go into a bush wearing it and then you're just almost invisible. I loved that, just being a camouflage, you know, I'm sure most kids of my age or younger or older, you know, probably aspire to being a hero or a ninja and that's probably the closest you can get um, in the modern world, I guess. And he wanted one of these ghillie suits and I thought, you know, this is quite a ridiculous idea. Why do you want a ghillie suit? You're not in the military, you're not playing paintball, you're not hunting. Why should we get this ghillie suit? And he said, Mum, I really want the ghillie suit. I said, OK, OK. It was no different to buying another outfit. No. So I thought, well, yes, OK, um, let's buy this ghillie suit. And when I bought him the ghillie suit, he really wanted to be photographed in it. And he actually just wanted an image of himself in this outfit, as you would, you know, if you had this new outfit. 
you, you want a picture of it, a memory of it. So I made this picture of him. He was so excited to see himself in his ghillie suit in the landscape. And he just wanted more and more pictures. Mm. But and the pictures that he wanted weren't exactly the ones that you felt you could do. Because if I remember correctly, his idea of the ghillie was um, what you just said, camouflage. So um, if he could get into this ghillie, then no one would know where he is. Well, I did uh, make some pictures like that. But for me, he just uh, formed, he became the landscape. He mm. was so um, concealed, hidden in the landscape that you had to look for him. In, and it also reminded me of one of those Where's Wally pictures where Wally is in there somewhere and you just have to try and find Wally. Mm. And I didn't want my pictures to become that much of a guessing no. game. But when I saw the figure against the landscape, it took on majesty of its mm. own. He became statuesque and he reminded me of Botticelli's Venus, mm. just arising from nature. So I wanted these images. He's part of the landscape. He belongs to the land where I photographed him. He comes out of the land, but he's not consumed by it, submerged. No. So yes, um, well, uh, you must be um, always wondering what comes next. And you've, <laughs> you're now making, you're now making the gillies. Mm. And um, there, is it is it something that I've always wondered about? And you know, obviously being close to all the agonies of making the work, mm. um, but there's one agony that I don't really have, and that is your agony of wondering what to do beyond the work, beyond a body of work, and not to not to um, um, solicit any reflections on what you might do next because I'm sure that will change many times. But um, is that stressful to have to think <laughs> about another um, body of work? or I try not to think about it. I, I mm. um, try to let the process happen naturally and organically and yeah. it usually does. I think... Uh, the more you worry about it, um, the more anxious you can feel. Yes. And um, that kind of freezes yes. the imagination. And I know from um, just working for over many, many years that ideas come and go. Yeah. Ideas will always come and go. Yes. Sometimes they come thick and fast. Yeah. So other times they don't. But they do come. Yeah, this is the one area where an artist really can't have a business plan. It just doesn't work that way, does it? No. It's, uh, it's organic. But I also believe that if you work at uh, your imagination, I don't mm. want to say your art practice, but if, if you work at your thoughts daily, not in any um, structured way, but allow your mind to wander and to think and to reflect and to observe. Things do mount up in time and the, the idea is realised. But it is a process and you just have to allow that process to happen. Oh, not stifle it with rush, I guess, which mm. is, uh, I think... Or ambition. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think sometimes uh, I've seen that some artists are so ambitious mm that that overrides mm. anything else. And I think that, you know, all artists, I have to say all artists want success, mm. but that can flow naturally if the work speaks. Mm. But uh, you have to let the, yourself speak and listen to yourself mm. and then yeah. hopefully those ideas and thoughts reflected in the work and people can relate and respond to that. Well, gratefully, the work speaks first to you, yeah. then to your models, yes. um, then to me, mm. and gratefully, other people beyond. 
as weird as it may be. <laughs>